the first thing I want you to do is imagine an eagle. But this is not like any eagle you've ever seen before. I mean, it looks like an eagle. Don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a giant bird of prey. So think, think large. Think four-foot wingspan. Think amazing hooked beak and eyes that can peer and pierce and see. Think talons and claws of strength. Right. So, so everything you think about with an eagle. But now I want you to imagine that the feathers of this eagle are like a rainbow. Or, or like a peacock, I suppose. Peacocks have such a bad rap, and, and rightly so. They're kind of useless little annoying birds. But the feathers are stunning. They're like opal-like, right? Multiple colored, multicolored in a single feather. So however you want to do it, this, this eagle, every pinion, every feather that it has is filled with a diversity of colors and spectrums. Shining and glorious, like all-powerful almost. And this eagle is flying high up in the sky, so far away that no hunter could ever reach this eagle. And it circles and it spins and it, everything that it can see, it is, it is over, right? It, it surveys and, and reigns really over everything it can see. And so it goes and, and it finds a, a peak, a mountain peak, on which are growing cedars. Now, cedars in the ancient world, it'd be like today if I said redwoods, right? If I say redwood, you go, oh, yeah, big tree, right? Well, cedars kind of function in that way. They're massive trees. And on top of that, to this day, if you have a cedar chest, right, or, or uh, a what furniture made of cedar, that's hard to come by, yeah? Because it's, it's good wood as well. It's solid wood. We're not talking pine. So this eagle... It's flying over this mountain that's just flush with cedars. But most of them are small, but there's one at the top. This, this king of the cedars. Biggest tree you ever saw. Just you know, the ancient redwood, hundreds of years old. However you want to imagine it, right? Because we are living in the land of hyperbole. We're landing in the land of, living in the land of parable and riddle here. So it's all picture. It's all picture. So this eagle of many colors descends upon this highest of all cedar trees. At the very top of the highest of all cedar trees, there is one special branch. It, it's the tallest branch. It's the plumage, in a sense. That plumage really would refer to the eagle, I suppose. But it's, it's like that. It's, it's the pinnacle of the tree. And it descends upon the pinnacle of this tree, and it rips it off. Just tears it off. Yanks it out, right? But it's enough. This isn't like cut off at the root, it's enough that it is a root. And so this eagle carries this ripped off and destroyed top of this great cedar, now small and humble and weak, right? It carries off this, this twig to a, a vast and beautiful land flowing with water, a great river delta, which again, for the ancient world, right today, you don't want to live in a river delta now, but if, in the ancient world, wealth and river deltas kind of go together because you got good land. You can grow the crops. You're safe from some of the um, uh, the droughts and whatnot that would come come about. So the river delta is a pretty safe spot, especially if you're a tree. <laughs> so this this cedar twig is planted by the river delta, and as the eagle kind of flies back up to survey and and still see what's going on, it's not leaving, but it has ensured the life of this twig. And the twig is able to, to grow. And it grows and it grows and it seeps up the water. And, and it doesn't become a cedar. It becomes a willow. And the willow is a tree that, well, it needs a lot of water. But it also, it grows very fast when it has that water. And it becomes pretty, right? They're beautiful in their own way. And they provide shade and, and flowers. And, and they can extend. But, but what do they never become again? They never become, well, uh, wood that you're going to make any furniture out of, right? Or very tall. Not very tall. Even the tallest widow, er, willow is nothing beside a cedar. So it's never going to be what it was, but it's going to thrive. And it's going to thrive and live in a healthy land planted by streams of water. Like unto Psalm 1 would tell us, right? Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, giving its fruit 
in its season. The wicked, well, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So here you have this, this tree, this willow, growing by the streams of water. But that's not enough. The willow is discontent. And so as it grows by this water, having everything it needs to be a successful and healthy and, and happy tree, it notices that there's another eagle. Not the first, not the eagle of many colors, but the it was just another eagle. It's, it's a good eagle. It's strong, right? It's a bird of prey. It can handle its own. It can descend swiftly on an enemy and take care of it if it needs to. Well, the willow decides to sort of ask this other eagle, hey, you think, you think that if you and I get together, I could be a cedar again? I can be what I, what I used to be? That's the parable, the riddle of the eagle in Ezekiel chapter 17. And it has a meaning. Having done the work now that I didn't do last time, I'm pretty clear what that meaning is. We're definitely going to talk about it. It's, it's pretty cool. It fits and it makes sense. What it may or may not do, <laughs> what it won't do enough of, frankly, is answer the other riddle of Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, about the eagle who cries out, Woe, 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 for the final three plagues which the trumpet blast of the angels will bring upon the earth. At least, I don't, I don't think it satisfies. It, it doesn't satisfy me. Now, then again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going to give you an answer. And I think it's connected. It's definitely connected. But it's just, just be ready. It's still the riddle of the eagle. It just doesn't quite, well, quite satisfy. But let, let's start with making sure we get Ezekiel 17 under our belt because it's going to help us see what we kind of knew from last time in the, in the survey of the eagle and all those other verses. We're going to do a little more of that today as well, but it's going to help us see the use of the eagle in the Old Testament, what, what the eagle stands for. And then we can definitely apply that to Revelation 8. It just, again, won't do what you want it to do, or what I want it to do, at least. But I will give this away here then. So, and, we, and this is sort of what we talked about last time, but, but I'm, I'm more convinced than ever then now. The eagle in the Old Testament Hebrew mind the language of Scripture, biblical theology, is an image of swift, conquering power. Swift, conquering power. So that the eagle, in other places again, is an image of wrath being sent by God against someone and an image of God's protective capacity to stand by and uphold those whom he is for. So in, in this way, the eagle is always, always a picture of God's authority in the world. Think fourth commandment, right? What do we know about the fourth commandment? We know that the command to honor father and mother is the source of all other authorities and structures which God has designed into the universe. That from Adam over his beloved Eve— to his children, Cain, Abel, and Seth. There is an authority given which flows out of the stewardship of creation handed over to Adam by God in Genesis 2, and that that stewardship includes other men, other people who are beneath him, and that this is, this is good. This is for the sake of the one under. Adam's authority over Cain, Abel, and Seth was for the sake of Cain, Abel, and Seth. It's only when one tries to take authority that is not theirs, Cain over Abel, that you're really running into trouble. So this authority of God is built into the family first, and from there, all other authority structures come. Luther would talk about it this way, that the government isn't really the government. The government is the fathers of the nation. 
And the pastor, the pastors, they're not really shepherds. I mean, they are, but they're really fathers of the congregation. They have an authority, which again is Jesus' authority. We won't go too far off into the office of the ministry right now. But so Luther would talk about them being fathers of the church. And then you have fathers of the family. And this gets us a little bit, we're really going off topic here a little bit, but don't forget this idea of the three estates. Modern Lutherans like to talk about the two kingdoms. Two kingdoms was not a huge, huge idea for Luther, even though it's become sort of our, our standard way of talking about it. And so and then we we mash mix it all with church and state and Thomas Jefferson, right? As as if the Bible teaches Jeffersonian distinctions between church and state. It's just nonsense. What Luther was more into, and he rightly so, because the scripture's more into this, is that there are not two, but three estates. It's not church and state. It's family, church, and governance, human governance over each other. As an aside, I was in a conversation recently trying to to reckon with a better way to, to convey this, this three estate reality, because it is. It's a great category or set of categories for understanding our relationship with each other as humans, our vocations, both as uh, just as humans in general and then as Christians. And the goal of the conversation was to give uh, more accessible words, catchier words to, to this idea. And I can't remember all that we came up with, but I, I, I got a couple here scratched down, so I'll share them with you. So the idea of family is more than just like, hey, we love each other. It's the idea, first, that you're a tribe, and that you have a name which endures and is connected, and is blood, right, with each other. But that as tribe, you, you eat together. So whether you want to call it hearth, like the old uh, Walther League hearth and altar, uh, or, or whether you want to call it the kitchen, and I'm leaning right now toward kitchen, even though that gets a bad rap these days. People people don't like their kitchens, and they speak poorly of the kitchen. A woman's life is in the kitchen, and that's bad, right? As if the kitchen's a bad thing. The kitchen's a good thing, regardless of who's in it. It's pretty important, at least in my world, <laughs> our world. Well, you don't you don't eat, you don't you die. So, well, kitchen, and then hearth and altar. Okay, it's altar being the church, but the church lives locally, right? As, as a congregation. And see, here here's where the kitchen comes in. I'm looking for some k c sounds. So you got kitchen, congregation, and and what? State? What? Federal government? I mean, it's really about your city. It's about locally being involved with your neighbors, right? So kitchen, congregation, and city, the three estates. Anyway, tangent. The three estates are areas in which the sovereign authority of God is built into the world that we see. The fourth commandment is another way of summarizing this, right? And the eagle, then, biblically speaking, is a picture of one who is over or in that capacity. Generally speaking, the eagle is reserved for kings, right? For, for those who are over in the capacity of the city or the state, if you still want to call it the state. But then again, God reserves this eagle language for talking about himself being over his church, his people Israel, back in Deuteronomy and other works of Moses, as well as in some of the prophets, by the way, and for his being over the world as well. So the point is that wherever the eagle is going, it's not just man's authority. It's not like men kings. This is God's built authority into the world being active, doing what it does. Now, it's fallen, it's broken, but it also still contains a very healthy, very good thing. And this is, the, again, the, the symbology of the eagle. I'm convinced of that part so far. So now then, let's go and, and take this both into and out of that parable from Ezekiel chapter 17, and you'll see that I'm not just saying this and making this up, but this is going to be demonstrated very, very clearly by this parable. Because, well, it's, it's kind of like the parables in the New Testament. Some of them, like you read it, and Jesus just says it, and you're like, okay, what's it mean? But some of them, the disciples do us a favor, right? They're like, hey, Jesus, can you tell us what it means? <laughs> uh, and there's no Jesus answering questions verbatim in Ezekiel 17, but the Lord, who is giving the prophecy to Ezekiel, does tell us exactly what it means. And from it, you're going to see, again, the use of the eagle as a symbol of God's authority. All right, so what should I do first? I, I could just, let me just tell you what's coming, 
and then we'll kind of let the text continue to tell us what's coming as well. So this, this conqueror of many colors, making rapid descent upon the cedar. What's that about? In short, and again, I'll, I'll try to prove this to you, but we're just going to we're going to set the thesis statement up here. In short, this eagle of many colors is King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And the many-colored plumage which he carries is not so much about his wealth. I mean, he was wealthy. Remember Daniel. We're going to do a little Daniel today. Daniel has this, uh, or maybe it's Nebuchadnezzar himself, excuse me. Daniel interprets the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has in which Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold on the top of the statue, right? So he definitely has wealth and authority, but is being the greatest kingdom that there ever was, which is sort of what that golden statue head is about, is it just about being wealthy? Is a man who is who is king of kings, do you call him king of kings because he has money? No, you call him king of kings because beneath him are other kings, other people, right? And so if you can imagine that the plumage of this eagle his feathers are his people, right? the, the ones who are under his authority, the ones he cares for or that live from his body, kind of literally. Well, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't just have one people underneath him. He's got many peoples. Huh? And, and so he is, he is a father of nations in this way. And we know this historically, definitely the case for Babylon and not the case so much for this other eagle that's going to show up. This other eagle that shows up, who only has one color, he's just kind of normal, but still powerful, still exercising God's authority, right? Uh, he, uh, he is still over peoples, they're just his peoples. This is Pharaoh, is who this is. This is the Pharaoh of Egypt, probably a guy named Hophra, the Apris of the Greeks. And I, depending on how much time we have, I may, I may dig a little more into that for us. But either way, it, it's the Pharaoh who was Pharaoh at the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, at the time of Zedekiah, the puppet king of Judah, at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. That's the Pharaoh who's being referenced by this other eagle. And again, this is going to become really obvious in a little bit, but just we're hat-tipping to it right now. And, and the thing about this Pharaoh, as is often the case with Egypt historically, is that Egypt... Egypt was like a, a, a king of many colors way, way back. You're looking back like before the days of Moses kind of thing, right? And, and even then, they never really extended their authority into Asia. They always wanted to, but they never really did. But even after they get toppled, and they, they topple a couple times, they go through some dynasties, but they never, uh, they never really rise again to the, the glory of old where they're building the pyramids, but neither do they ever get weak. Like, there aren't many people who conquer Egypt. It doesn't, it, not many, it doesn't happen not until much, much later. And even then, it's, it, they conquer Egypt so that they can, like, rule Egypt as its own thing. I think Cleopatra and, and uh, uh, Mark Antony and all that kind of stuff. So, that's who this is. It, it's it's a, a strong figure. A strong figure. And we're going to try to put the pieces together as to why you have Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh being brought up here, but then let's let's get to this cedar. So Nebuchadnezzar, the flying eagle of many colors, he sees this lofty cedar, this beautiful, beautiful thing, right, that is not yet his, but he wants to make his own. And this is, in all likelihood, not it is, and the reasoning is in all likelihood, but this is, without question, the royal family of David in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting about the, the parable itself is it doesn't say David in Jerusalem. It says this, this great eagle with great wings and long pinions full of feathers of variegated colors came to Lebanon and took the top of the Caesar, cedar. And that can really throw you off because Lebanon is not in Judea. <laughs> it's, it's to the north. And it is definitely where the cedars grow, the cedars of Lebanon. I'm sure that you've heard that phrase before. But Jerusalem is known to some extent for its connection with Lebanon, particularly under the reign of Solomon, when the king of Lebanon sent to Solomon cedars for the building of the temple. 
so that if you go to the top of this mountain, Zion, right? And it's really kind of a little mountain range, but Jerusalem, this marvelous, marvelously placed city, uh, strategically, militarily placed city at the top of a mountain in the, in the midst of a mountain valley, right? So you got to go into a valley and then go up the mountain. So it's like got really hard to approach if you're an army. And then it's also fed by streams of water. So it's got, it's got its own water supply. At the very pinnacle of this, at the very top of this, is this massive, ancient world, beautiful structure, wonder of wonders, called the temple, that underneath all of its gold plate and marble is, uh, well, is cedar, right? Is the cedars of Lebanon. And so here you have the parable, the riddle, doing something that we maybe would say you're not supposed to do these days. You remember when your, your grammar teacher would be like, don't mix your metaphors, and you're like, you're speaking Greek. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Don't, I don't understand, right? Uh, conjugate the parable of the uh, the financial brickwork or something, right? Like, you're like, you don't even know what, what it meant, right? So not mixing your metaphors means not taking two symbols and shoving them together because it can cause confusion, uh, the horse ran like a boy who was a cat, right? It, it, you, you lose any meaning at a certain point. But the, the prophets, and, and John as well, they, they don't mind mixing their metaphors. <laughs> and so they do it quite a bit here. So in the midst of this riddle of this eagle of much plumage, we suddenly then have another symbol, which is like by two extended divisions to the side, a reference to Zion. But you have to have all, sort of, all these pieces to build up into it. And so it's both Zion, the mountaintop of Jerusalem, the temple, and it's the tree that's actually in Lebanon in the forest, right? Uh, but it's not actually Lebanon, it's, it's, it's the house of David. And this house of David with Solomon as sort of its glorious picture, David absolutely as its root, but you got the old the old covenant all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Adam connected to this as well. The line of the seed of the of the the Messiah who will come, the one who's going to save the world from the devil, all that. And at the at the peak of this right now, at the very tip top of this is one man who remains. Right? One man who remains. And that one man who remains is this guy, Zedekiah. But it's a little tricky here because, again, we're mixing metaphors, and so it's actually two guys. Well, it's actually three. Zedekiah is the one who remains, who is going to become this willow. And yet the twig is probably a guy named Jehiachim, although it could also be Jehiachim, and that's a bit confusing there, isn't it? It's, it's a father and son team, Chim the, the younger and Kim the elder, both kings of Judah, if only briefly. So to try to make it as clear as mud, uh, Jehoiakim is the first guy who is in line for the throne and becomes king of Judah. He eventually dies in battle against Babylon, and his son Jehoiachim becomes king, but only very briefly because by this point, B Babylon's kind of done with Jehoiakim. They kill him, and then they take his son away. We're going to come back to that. Uh, and then they put Zedekiah who is the brother of Jehoiakim, right, the elder, uh, put him on the throne. And the metaphor here is like all of these guys kind of wrapped into one based on what happens to them and based on the symbology. So starting with Jehoiakim, he reigned for 11 years over the nation of Judah. And Chronicles tells us he did this in the ungodly ways of his fathers. Jeremiah represents this guy as a poor prince who enriched himself by unjust oppression of the people, quote, whose eyes and heart were directed upon nothing but upon gain and upon innocent blood to shed it and upon oppression and violence to do them. And it was in his days that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel, it's the second kings now, came up and Jehoiakim became subject to him three years and then he revolted from him again. Now, there's all sorts of cool stuff here. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is no joke in his own right. Uh, his name apparently is a, is a mixture of names. You can pronounce it different ways too. Uh, Nebuchadrakara and uh, Nebuchadrezzar. But it's, it's composed of the name of their god, Nabu or Nebo. And the Arabic word for power, Qadar. And the word czar or sar, we even get czar today, right? Prince, yeah? So, you know, prince of God's power is, is this guy's name. 
and he was the son of Nabopolassar, who was the founder of the Chaldean monarchy. And we know about both these guys from, from ancient history, not just from the scriptures. And his first campaign against Jerusalem, as again recorded in Second Chronicles, says that against Jehoiakim came up Nebuchadnezzar and bound him with brass chains to carry him to Babylon. And Daniel says, In the year three of the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, and a portion of the holy vessels. And he brought them, the vessels, into the land of Shinar, into the house of his God. All right, so what this means is that this guy who was going to be punished by God, Nebuchadnezzar comes against him, and he, he wins, and he puts him in chains. He's going to take him away. But by some sort of pleading or crying or, or, or begging, and also by giving gifts, right? Gifts from his own God, submitting his own God to the gods of Babylon, Jehoiakim is able to retain uh, sort of a, a stewardship over the land and not be taken away. Instead, God gets taken away, right? God's vessels, holy vessels, the ark's not gone yet, but God's holy vessels get taken away. And this is how evil this guy was. Like, rather than take what God had promised to do, even though it's wrath, right, uh, he, he tries to find a way out of it. It's probably also important to point out that around this time, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and Egypt were at odds. And they're, they're vying, they're, they're both upstart nations vying for control to rule other nations. And so they, they come head to head with each other pretty close to Judah and Jerusalem, not quite. But uh, there's, a, there's a fight between them as Egypt is attempting to attack uh, Chaldeans, uh, attack Babylon at a place called Carchemish on the Euphrates. And uh, Nico, the king of Egypt at that time, is just demolished. I like the language that Kyle and Dalitz use. They say that he is smote. Nico is smote. And from there, Babylon's off to be on the rise to being what it will be. In that time period, it begins to extend its power over all the all the countries in the area so that this is when Jerusalem and Jehoiakim come under their control. They give their tribute. They become kind of part of it. Babylon even goes so far as to send a satrap down, sort of a governor, to be in charge of Egypt. And that guy then, <laughs> uh, uh, he actually rebels. And Nebuchadnezzar is really gets his he he cuts his teeth a little bit on that battle. He's sent by Nabopolassar, his father, down to subject Egypt again. And during that time, he falls. Nabopolassar falls sick and dies. Nebuchadnezzar's got to rush back to Babylon because he's got to establish himself as the king now, as the emperor. It is during that time that Jehoiakim decides to rebel. Against him, the Chaldeans send in some Ammonites and some Moabites and some of their own troops as well. In that battle, so far as we can tell, Jehoiakim is killed, but the battle's not over yet. Jerusalem still stands. It hasn't been, been conquered yet. So this his young son, Jehoiachim, right? This is this other guy, the younger. He gets put on the throne, but he can barely withstand. It's only like three months until he then is, in fact, taken in chains, like his father almost was, to Babylon. He is, a again, a twig snapped off the top of a cedar and taken away to be planted by the streams of Babylon putting in his place as like a satrap. He wasn't a satrap, but the same kind of idea. Jehoiachim's uncle, Jehoiakim's brother, Mataniah, who also, at least as king, goes by the name Zedekiah, which interestingly means the righteousness of Yahweh. But the righteousness of Yahweh, this guy is not. While he might not have had quite the energy for evil, like he was actively seeking to destroy Yahwehism, you know, Israelitism, uh, he, he hardly took his faith seriously in any way, shape, or form, and even seeks to use, well, to use the name of God to lie. So that in the same year, uh, the fourth year of his reign, he makes a trip to Babel. And apparently this is to investigate how the captives are being treated that are there, but also to assure the king of his fidelity. Now, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but his oath to be subject to the king of Babylon was taken in the name of Yahweh. Which means, so far as Yahweh is concerned, this is an oath of Yahweh to the king of Babylon, which Zedekiah is to keep. So he goes to assure the king, yes, I'm going to keep this. And within the same year, just a few months later, 
ambassadors from the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Tyrians, and the Sidonians come to Jerusalem and seek to make an alliance with him to throw off the yoke of Chaldea, recognizing that they can also entice Egypt and this guy Pharaoh Hophra, a priest was his again Greek name, who had just ascended the throne there to, to join them in this rebellion. Now, Jeremiah's tied up in this as well. He actually is in Jerusalem saying, don't do it. <laughs> don't go to Egypt, that broken reed that pierces those that lean against it, all that kind of stuff. So he, he, he says, do not trust in Egypt. Do not do this revolt. But seeing that Nebuchadnezzar, at least according to some, was engaged in a war with the Medes, right, the Medes and the Persians, well, he decides to, to do so. In Ezekiel 17 is exactly in the midst of this. It is to Zedekiah that Ezekiel is effectively speaking, or well, that the Lord is speaking through Ezekiel. So, again, the cedar branch slash willow is all three of these guys. Jehoiakim is snatched off. Jehoiachim is planted in Babylon. And yet the willow on the mountaintop is, well, it's free to be a willow. And Zedekiah is, is discontent with that. What's perhaps most important here is to remember that this happening, both the subjection of Jehoiakim and the, the subjection of Zedekiah, these guys who are heirs to David's line, but now are being subjected to the king of Babylon of his rainbow-colored plumage, the power of God, right? This is done by an oath at God's command. God has foretold that this would happen in his prophets because of the unrighteous ways of, the, of Judah, because they have rejected the covenant, because they've rejected the sacrifices, because ultimately it's because they've rejected the grace of Jesus Christ. Not just the law, but the grace. They've, they've, they've sought law in themselves and trying to justify their kingdoms in the world. That's why they keep rebelling against, well, against their oath. So here the prophets have said this will come to pass. It comes to pass, and there is extracted from Zedekiah, also from Jehoiakim, but from Zedekiah, there is extracted an oath, a promise that he will serve this other king. And the scriptures see this oath, and Ezekiel particularly sees this oath, this promise, as being, well, a covenant of God honestly. It's not the Old Covenant from Sinai, or quite the Davidic Covenant, and it's certainly not the New Testament in the blood of Jesus, but it kind of is. It's kind of all those things at once, and it is a, it is a covenant of the exile, right? So it is, here is the exile you are under. I've said I'm going to exile you. Here it is. I will restore you. And even before They've been taken all the way away. It's like God's mercy is being shown here. Like, here's the, the, the guy who I've sent to exile you is so kind for an ancient world king. He'll actually exile you in your own land. Like, you don't have to get uprooted and put in a ghetto somewhere else. He'll just do it in your own land. Remember what happened to the north? How they were just dispersed to the nations? You guys get to stay here. And so when you take an oath, a vow to have fidelity to him and be under him, that he's king of kings, but you get to remain a king. Well, this is a vow before God. This is a covenant before God. Zedekiah is then this, this twig planted by the, the streams of Babylonian waters that formerly a cedar, sure, but you, you could be a willow. You could be a tree planted beside water bearing fruit in season. You could do well. But then here's, here's where the parable really comes in, right? Here, here's the problem. Is that this, this willow's discontent being a willow? He thinks somehow it is his right to become and be a, a cedar again. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, give a riddle, and relate it to the house of Israel. And say, Thus saith the Lord, a great eagle with pinions of feathers of many colors came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar, and he plucked off its topmost and brought it to Canaan's land. To a merchant city, he set it. And he took the seed of the land and put it into seed land, good land for sowing. Took it away to many waters and set it as a willow, and it grew and became an overhanging vine of low stature. Its branches turned towards him, its root beneath him. It became a vine and produced fruits and foliage. 
but there was another great eagle with wings and many feathers. And behold, the vine stretched its roots languishly toward him and extended its branches towards him that he might water it. It was planted in a good field by many waters to send its roots out and bear fruit and become glorious. Thus says the Lord, Will it now thrive? Will they not come and pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers? Will it not with a strong arm and with many peoples be impossible to raise it up? Although it is planted, will it thrive? Will it not wither when the east wind comes? Right, so there, there's, there's the wrath. There's a couple other pieces we haven't picked up in the parable, but you, you get the gist of it now, right? Zedekiah is reaching out to Egypt, and Ezekiel, through the Lord, is saying, this is not going to work, it's going to destroy you. Now, some of these other pieces, you know, Canaan, it's not really about Canaan. Canaan was a merchant land, and Babylon's now a merchant land, and it even mentions a merchant city. You got that. You got the bit about it being a healthy vine producing fruit. That's very biblical language for the covenant of Israel before God continuing in the faith, right? I am the vine, you are the branches, even at that level. But the heart of this is that Zedekiah's attempt is going to be the, the end, the end of the house of David. And what follows then in the book of Ezekiel explains this in no uncertain terms. Verse 11 goes on to say, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say to the refractory race, Do you not know what this means? Behold, the king of Babel came to Jerusalem, and took its king and its princes, and brought them to Babel to himself. And he took of the royal seed, and made a covenant with him, and caused him to enter an oath. And he took the strong ones of the land, that it might be a lowly kingdom, not lifted up, that he might keep his covenant and stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his messengers to Egypt, that it might give him horses and many people. Will he prosper? Will he that has done this escape? Will he that has broken the covenant escape? As I live, says the Lord, surely in the place of the king who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, in Babel he will die. And not with great army and much people will Pharaoh act when they cast up a rampart and build siege towers to take off many souls. He has despised an oath to break the covenant. And behold, he has given his land and done all this. He will not escape. Therefore thus saith the Lord, As I live, my oath which he has despised, my covenant which he has broken, I will give upon his head. I will spread out my net so that he will be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babel and contend with him there on account of his treachery which he has been guilty of towards me. And all his fugitives and all his regiments will fall by the sword and those who remain shall be scattered to the winds. You will see that I, the Lord, have spoken. Now I'll tell you, I can never really read Ezekiel without wanting to be Samuel L. Jackson. If you don't know the Pulp Fiction reference, I'm, I don't know that I can recommend it to you if you're of a queasy stomach type nature, but uh, man, there is a scene where he, <laughs> he is the voice of God speaking Ezekiel in wrath, and it's totally out of context and totally wrong, and yet it's oh so right at the same time. But you see here that God considers the oath his oath. He considers breaking subjection to Nebuchadnezzar, breaking subjection to him. When God sends a curse... You're not supposed to rebel against the curse because under the curse, he is always having mercy. And so the only way to not get the mercy is to refuse the curse. I mean, this gets to the sin against the Holy Spirit, right? To the very nature of, of the problem of unbelief. The only ones not to be forgiven on the last day are those who don't want forgiveness because they think their sin is okay. They think their sin is fine. That's the problem. The problem is not the evil actions by themselves. They're bad. Don't get me wrong. They're not good. But they're the fruit of something else. And that thing, that, that, that root that is wicked, that bears them, is unbelief. Unbelief. 
which breaks the covenant, which refuses to see that the curses of God are there to bind us, to curb us and hem us in so that he can save us. Zedekiah was put beneath the king of Babel that he might be saved. And it is in trying to throw off the punishment that would lead to his salvation that he ends up losing that salvation. And in this regard, this whole picture is a picture of the history of the world. And Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of God. Now, he's not actually God, although he certainly has some interaction with God via Daniel. But he is an image of God himself. And this is where the eagle, then, the eagle of many colors, the rainbow eagle, is a picture of God himself. And this is where there's a, there's a connection point here, finally, maybe, to Revelation chapter 8, verse 13 where this random eagle, who is not an angel, shows up crying out about the woes, right? Crying out that underneath the authority of God's victorious and swift action that cannot be undone, which sees all things, there are three woes, three sad things coming. And those, those sad things coming, like the eagle, will be swift, they will not delay. This is not some, some blueprint for the end of the world. This is going to be a fast and hard description of our current situation. Now, I've been saying that from the start about Revelation. It's a picture of now. It's a picture of now from many angles. Now, what I, what I don't know that I can say, and I'm probably wrong, so I'll, I'll just say that. I'm going to say it, but I'm going to tell you I'm probably wrong. So this eagle in Revelation does not have many colors in his wings. But he's in the place of Nebuchadnezzar's eagle. Right? He's kind of doing what Nebuchadnezzar's eagle does. He's part of the oversight of God and observing, even being connected to the actions of God on behalf of these trumpeteers. There is a rainbow that's going to show up in the midst of these woes, at the very heart of them. Remember, we've been talking, too, about how uh, trumpet three becomes five, six, and seven in a expanding spiral. And just today, as I was looking at it all again, I had the thought that there's, there's even more to that. It's not just an expanding spiral. It's a spiral in and then a spiral out, or what we would maybe call a chiasm. Now, I've talked about this before. If you don't remember, that's fine. I'll do it again here. Chiasm. Think of an X, right? We see X and we think X. A Greek would have seen it and thought chi because that's the K sound, but it looks the same on the page. It's, a, it's an X, right, on the page. And the shape of the X is a mirror, right? You have one side that looks exactly like the other side. They're a complete replication. And this mirror goes from two outer points to a central inner point that joins. Well, scholars of Hebrew poetry and Hebrew thought began to observe, I don't know when this started, but they began to observe that it often works in a similar pattern, that it moves from the outside to the inside, and as it gets to the inside, it will narrow to a single point, single meaning, and then it will expand again back out in mirror fashion. And they call this a chiasm, right? a poetic form or a structural form that puts its thesis statement, its main thing, the focal point, not at the beginning of the end, but at the very middle. And then going to and from the very middle, you have parallels, images that bounce off each other and reflect each other, driving you out to the to the what the, the bookend, the conclusions. And the bookends will have their own thesis. I mean, it's not like there is no main point, but they, they kind of like balance each other. And I, I had the thought that the final three trumpets are in fact a chiasm. And part of this is because at the middle of them, in this, uh, the sixth trumpet, well, you got Jesus, and Jesus has got a rainbow, <laughs> you know, uh, and 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 well, maybe that doesn't explain it all, but to me, it's kind of like ooh, ooh, ooh. So how much of this eagle referencing us back to another parable, another riddle of an eagle with many colors, is in fact the authority of God's control in Christ over all which is yet to come, which we're going to see at the heart of it when we get to that that angel with his land, feet on the land and the sea uh, and the rainbow around him. And we'll have to talk about more about that when we get there, but I, 
uh, again, I, I will caveat this. I could really be wrong. This, this eagle thing, it's a riddle, and the answer might just be we got no idea. <laughs> uh, if you want the soft pedal dancer, the soft pedal dancer is he is representing that all which is taking place is taking place in the midst of kingdoms, and we're actually going to see a couple kingdoms with the beast of the land of the sea anyway. But it's in the midst of all the kingdoms that ever were, which are still under God's control and authority, so nothing gets outside of him, even as this story of fall and redemption takes place throughout the grand history. And the eagle is just kind of a picture of that. And he cries out, whoa, whoa, whoa. They look, at, look at the fall, look at the fall, look at the fall. Yet through the midst of it, those of us with ears to hear will hear an angel with an eternal gospel to proclaim, crying out as well by the end of this thing. So th- that works too, right? No problem. That's fine. That works. Uh, is it is it fully satisfying? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm sure we'll continue to wrestle with it as we go. I, I want to. We've only got a few minutes left here, and I want to just touch on a few more pieces from Ezekiel because they're they're pretty cool when we find it because the it goes on. After this bit about, you know, I'm going to come and destroy you, Zedekiah, there's a few more verses where the Lord does not forget his promises. Verse 22 says, Thus says the Lord, And I will take from the top of the high cedar, and I will set it. From the topmost of its shoots will I pluck off a tender sprout, and I will plant it on a high and exalted mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it, and it will put forth branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar, so that all the birds of every plumage will dwell beneath it, and in the shade of its branches they shall dwell. And all the trees of the field will learn that I, the Lord, have lowered the lofty tree, lifted up the low tree, made the green tree wither, and made the withered tree become green. That's actually the end, then, of this segment. And, and what goes on next is another chapter in Ezekiel, and it completely changes. And here, here now, wow, what a thing. There's so much Jesus here. It's, it's so amazing. So after all of this has been done, and the willow is going to be just demolished for what it is, God says, oh, wait, wait, in Jerusalem, that place of cedars, there's yet a sprout I can take from the highest edge. Remember that the high top of the tree in this parable is simply the genealogy come down to the present moment. So there's going to come a present moment with a tender twig. Remember this? The sprout, the netzer, taken from the stump of David's line. There's going to be the, the highest. Isn't it? Think about it this way. He's going to, I will take it from off the highest part of the cedar, which at the time will be a stump, and there's not much left, but there's still a twig there coming up, a shoot sent forth, I will take him and I will put him onto a mountain. You got to think Calvary. Again, Zion, Jerusalem, of course, but Calvary. Come to Zion's holy mountain, sinners ruined by the fall. And there I will plant it, Jesus, his own body, like literally in the ground, in the dirt, in that place. I will plant him and he will put forth branches. Do you remember this? I said it already today. I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who remains in me will bear much fruit. Yeah, I will I will plant it. He will put forth branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar so that all the birds of every plumage notice the many colors. Birds of every feather. Again, the, the eagle was over many, but now it's even more than that. Do you remember when Jesus was in a rather extended discourse teaching the crowds in riddles, in parables? And after talking about a sower casting his seed upon different types of soil, after talking about weeds spreading up because the enemy had sown them, he put another parable before them saying, The rain of the heavens is like a grain of a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. Though the smallest of all the seeds, when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Isn't it funny? The more I learn about the Old Testament, the more I realize how many times when Jesus is talking, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. 
I mean, it's, it's paraphrased. It's his words. He's doing with it what he will. But this prophecy from Ezekiel here of the seed planted in the ground that will be a tree for the birds of the nations to put their, uh, their rest beneath it, that within the holy kingdom of Jesus' resurrection, within the church, the gathering of saints and sinners, same people, into faith, all nations do indeed dwell. And the King of kings and Lord of lords, far greater than an eagle, is in fact the tree which shelters us. Even the eagles have to sit under the branches of this tree. So that all other trees of the field, it does mix metaphors if you go back to Ezekiel here, right? All the other trees, this would be Zedekiah, the willow, and let's just say Nebuchadnezzar, the other really big tree, and right? So it makes a metaphor, for sure. But all others who would seek to have any kind of life-giving purpose must, in fact, dwell beneath the great tree, the cedar, which is Christ. They will learn that it is Yahweh the Lord who both gives life and takes it away. It is Yahweh the Lord who, who lowers, who cuts off the top of the proud tree and who goes down to the, the humble tree, the broken tree, and plants fertilizer around it for three more years and seeks to make it so that it will grow. And, and don't miss this too, right? So when he... When he lowers the lofty tree and he lifts up the low tree, he cuts down the tree that is alive and he takes the tree that is dead and he raises it up. Well, we sing a song like that, don't we? Lift up the tree. Lift up the, the cross. So that when he says, I make the green tree to wither and the withered tree become green, indeed, how truly true is it? that this earth, ruined by us and punished by God in witheringness, so that thorns and thistles and sweat of our brow are what we have remaining, so that the best we can come up with to try to keep each other in line is to cut down trees, cut off their branches, and nail people to them as a punishment. Well, that very thing, the results of our curse, God then turns on its head to make the, well, the cross a life-giving, everlasting tree with a fruit beyond measure. Do you know this one? Sing my tongue the glorious battle. Sing the ending of the fray. Now, above the cross, the trophy, sound the loud triumphant lay. Tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim, won the day faithful cross, true sign of triumph, be for all the noblest tree. None in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit thine equal be. Symbol of the world's redemption for the weight that hung on thee. If not that, then perhaps you've heard this one. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, none besides you, no rock like our God. Talk no more of your vanity. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowing. and By him all things are weighed. The bows of the mighty men and heroes are broken, but the feeble and weak bind up in strength. Those who were fatted and full must hire themselves out now for bread, but those who were starving no longer hunger. The barren woman now has borne seven children, while she who has had so many finds herself forlorn. The Lord kills, and the Lord makes alive. The Lord brings down to the grave, and the Lord resurrects. The Lord makes poverty, and the Lord makes wealth. The Lord brings down, and the Lord lifts up. He raises up 
the impoverished from the dust. He lifts up those in deep need from their ashes and sits them with princes to inherit a throne of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his believers, yet the wicked shall be cut off in gloom, and not by the might of man shall they prevail. Yes, the enemies of the Lord shall be broken into many pieces. Against them he shall thunder from the heavens. The Lord will judge to the very ends of the earth and give strength to his king. He shall exalt the horn of his Christ. I might not have answered the riddle, but I think we're ready. Whoa. Woe, woe, to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? If so, Pastor Fisk and his family would love to have it, in part to pay for technology and paperwork to keep Rev Fisk raw going, and in part to just enjoy a night out together. Pledging a dollar twenty-five on Patreon, only five dollars a month lets the worker know his labor is appreciated. And if you're a true fan, you can give even more. You can find the link to Patreon in the show notes and check out the other giving levels there, including advertising your product, your family, or your congregation on Rev Fisk Raw. Lock and load, then rock on.